This is Dr. Paul Shank, our presenter for this evening. He is a scientist here at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Um, he studies these things, icy, icy objects, dwarf planets, um, asteroids, satellites, I, satellites moons. moons. There you, he'll, he'll tell you better than I can. Uh, really great research, really exciting research. In addition to that research, he takes that data and he makes these really great visualizations with them. Uh, there is an example of some playing out in the lobby on the uh, screen. If you didn't see it on the way in, check it out uh, on your way out uh, this evening. That's the screen near the front desk. So without much further ado at all, I'll turn it over to Dr. Paul Shank. Oh, that's mine. All right, so greetings. So raise your hands and admit it. Who's here for the free feed after the show? <laughs> come on, come on. Oh, well, that's why I'm here anyway. So, but a more serious question. Who was here the last time I was in this room in April, I think it was, giving a preview. Uh, I think I see a few hands in the back. Yes, a preview of what New Horizons was going to do at Pluto this summer, right? How many? Hands? Yeah, a fair number of you, and obviously there was more because we didn't use the overflow room that week. So, was it worth it? Yeah. Was it worth it? Yeah. yeah, that's what I wanted to hear. That's what I wanted to hear. Okay. So, in reality, though, the past 12 months, 12 to 13 months, has actually been one of the most exciting in the history of planetary exploration. We've not just explored Pluto, we've, but we've explored three very interesting and dynamic objects. Uh, starting with the Comet Encounter with uh, you, the Rosetta spacecraft in August, and that's been ongoing. It dropped a lander on the surface back in November, which I actually heard back from briefly uh, two months ago, uh, and then it went silent again. And it's actually an active comet. I'm not going to talk about that uh, because uh, I, I don't work on that mission, so I, all I know is why I read in the newspapers, and, and you can do that too. Um, but I, what I want to talk about is the other, object, other two objects that have been the focus of exploration this year, and that's Ceres, uh, which is the largest asteroid, and it's a dwarf planet, which is a, a, new, a new taxonomy, which, I, which we can talk about if you want. And then, of course, Pluto. Uh, so th this has been the first time we've explored these kinds of bodies uh, that have not been orbiting uh, a major planet. We've been looking at the moons of Saturn, the moons of Jupiter. These are the first times we've looked at icy bodies orbiting the sun like this. They're large and significant. Uh, and what I'm going to do today is going to briefly give you a little bit of history behind the mission and why these objects are important, and then show you some of the results. But I want to try to do that as quickly as possible so that we can get to questions, because I know that's probably why you really want to be here, is to, to sound out and find out what, what it was really like and all that kind of fun stuff. So briefly, this is the architecture of the solar system. You can see the major planets in their colors. and the. Uh, the two areas of interest for the talk today are the asteroid belt, uh, which is this fuzzy yellow circle in the very center. And you can see it's very small compared to the scale of the, of the giant planets that we know, Uranus and Neptune and, and all that. And then out beyond the orbit of Neptune, which is the, uh, the bright blue circle, is the Kuiper belt, which is populated by thousands of small objects, including Pluto, which is in the lopsided orbit there which was the first such object discovered back in 1930, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So uh, we're going to drive right into this and talk about the asteroid belt first and deal with Ceres. Uh, now, the asteroid belt is uh, the zone between Mars and Jupiter, of course, and it's populated by roughly about a million objects now that we've actually been able to catalog. And this belt forms a transition between the rocky inner planets that we know and love and that we live on and, and can, can work on and we can explore the Mars if we want to once we get around to that. And then the outer zone, which is populated by Jupiter and, its, and Saturn and all those other large objects and their small icy satellites and stuff like that. So the asteroid belt is this population of debris, basically, between those two zones, the rocky and the water-rich zones uh, of the outer zone uh, solar system. And perhaps more interestingly, we actually have samples from this region. Uh, meteorites come to the Earth all the time, and we collect them. We go to Antarctica. i got a couple of friends in Antarctica right now. They're collecting them on the ice. And they come in a large variety. They come in stony types, iron rich, uh, which you can go to some of the science museums and, and see. 
and they're relics of the planetary formations. We actually have meteorites from Vesta, but not from Ceres, which is the primary topic of our, of our well, we don't actually know whether we have meteorites from Ceres, but uh, we, we don't think we do. So Ceres was discovered back in January, January 1st, actually, 1801. It's a great way to start a century. And uh, there was this gap between uh, Mars and Jupiter that people wondered whether there was an object. And it took a long time. It took a, a telescope to discover that. And it was discovered by Giuseppe Piazzi in Palermo, where I'm going to be in three weeks, uh, attending a, a team meeting. Uh, discovered a small planet between Mars and Jupiter. There's a lot of excitement about that. But by the end of the 19th century, it was apparent that there were a couple dozen of these objects that were known through the increasing power of the telescope. Uh, um, and it became obvious that this was a zone of debris. And of course, as the 20th century rolled around, we discovered thousands and then millions. It was named Ceres. Actually, it was originally planned to be named after the um, uh, governor of, of, of Sicily, but that didn't <laughs> go over very well with, with the neighboring, neighboring uh, countries. Uh, so they ditched the idea, named after Ceres, the goddess of agriculture. Uh, which is fine, but the asteroids became known as the vermin of the skies. And if you remember my talk in March, I described why that was. And mainly is because there were thousands of these in the 20th century, and, and nobody wanted to study them. Nobody cared. They were just rocks in space. And in those days, you had to take long photographic exposures of the Orion Nebula or the Horsehead Nebula or whatever it was. And you know, chances were that some stray asteroid would, would roll through the exposure and ruin your, ruin your shot. So, People didn't like asteroids. It was like, you know, tedious long nights at the telescope uh, studying light curves and stuff like that is like, was not a very glamorous profession, at least until the space age. Ceres, the largest of these, languished along with the other asteroids in obscurity for about 200 years. Uh, but we did find out a few things. We found out that it has a relatively low density of about two. Ice has a density of about one. The moon has a density of about three. So it was about halfway between that. And that suggested that there was a large volume of water ice somewhere inside Ceres. And uh, in the late 19, uh, actually in the early part of this century, uh, Hubble Space Telescope finally got some resolvable images. And you can see the image there. That was the best image we had before the mission. And it shows Texas to scale. So you know the approximate scale is, is about the size of Texas. And the, the interior was believed to be something like this, a rocky inner core surrounded by a thin shell, maybe 100 kilometers uh, wide, or may, uh, probably more like about 50 kilometers wide, rather, of, of icy material surrounding that. So it's a little bit unusual. Most asteroids don't have this. Vesta, which is one of the next largest asteroids, is basically all rock. So Ceres was a little bit unusual. And one of the other uh, European telescope, the Herschel telescope, I think it was, yeah, space telescope, uh, detected what they believed to be water vapor uh, intermittently surrounding Ceres as well, which suggested that there might be some sort of venting. But at low resolution, you couldn't tell what it was. So there was the question, is Ceres an active body? And we still don't know the answer to that, actually. So in 2001, the mission, Dawn mission was approved by NASA to visit both Vesta and Ceres. I'm not going to talk about Vesta today. Um, I have a few slides at the back up if, if we want to get into that. But it was the first mission to actually go to the largest asteroids. And if you think about that, it took 50 years of the space age to actually get to, to visit the largest asteroids. That's kind of, kind of a puzzler why that took so long. But in any case, it finally happened, and we now have it. This is the spacecraft approaching an artist's rendering of, of Ceres, so don't, don't pay any attention to that. But I just wanted to briefly describe what the spacecraft was and what it could do. These large wings are across the solar panels, and it carried a, a camera that could take images in stereo for topography, a spectrometer to measure the, or at least try to determine the mineralogy, what kind of minerals are on the surface. A gamma ray telescope, which basically measures how gamma rays bounce off the surface and then come back to the signal, that tells you the elemental uh, signature of the surface, whether there's how much potassium there is, how much iron there is, how much uh, hydrogen there is, that sort of thing. Um, and to do that, we have to actually wait till we get to the lowest orbit. So we're not even down there yet where we can actually use that instrument. We have to get really, really close. 
And then there's the gravity mapping, which is not done with an instrument, but done with a radio uh, Doppler signal to determine what the gravitational signature of the, of the interior is. Now you notice this blue flame, uh, which is the uh, first time we've actually used an ion propulsion system. It's powered by the xenon gas, uh, which basically uh, ionizes uh, xenon gas. <laughs> Um, and expels it out the engine. This is not a typical chemical burn where you react uh, hydrazine with oxygen or, or some oxidizer or something like that and blast it out the engine. This is very low thrust. If you stuck your hand in this, it would feel like the weight of a paper clip. It's very low thrust, but it's on all the time. So after years of burning, you can actually get out to the outer solar system. And that's what it did. Uh, so this is the trajectory that the spacecraft took to get to first Vesta and then to Ceres. And you can see the launch took here, took place here in two, early 2007, or late 2007. Uh, went around once, got a gravity assist from Mars. And you notice the two different colors. Uh, the, the dark blue is when the thrusters are off, the ion thrusters. And the, and the light blue is when the thrusters are on. So you can see it's thrusting most of the time as it goes around in this orbit. So it went around Mars and arrived at Vesta in uh, summer of 2011, stayed there for a year, uh, which took it all the way out there, and then it coasted for another two years, well, it didn't coast, it actually thrusted for another two years until it arrived here. And we're now somewhere around here, I think, if I, if I remember correctly, because we arrived uh, more or less on schedule in April. And that's what this looks like. This is the uh, perspective view of the trajectory that came over the top and then went into a polar orbit. We're now about halfway down, somewhere around here, in a much closer orbit now. This was a shot I took off the screen in, in April, or I'm sorry, March. But it gives you a sense of the perspective. Okay, so this uh, gives also a sense of the size of the body relative to the objects that we know. This is uh, an actual approach image of Ceres from the spacecraft. This is also Vesta, by the way. You can tell it's a little bit smaller. But it gives you a sense of the scale. If you went out, uh, I think the moon is out tonight, but I'm not sure. It might probably out a little bit later. I think we just had the full moon. But you can uh, see that Ceres is about uh, one quarter to one third the size of the moon. So if you go outside and see the moon tonight, you get a sense for how big Ceres is in comparison to that. And then of course there's Mercury and, and Mars. And then Earth is, is much bigger than that, uh, even. And this shows the asteroids that we visited with spacecraft, including the tiny Itakawa, which was visited by a Japanese spacecraft a couple of years ago. It's less than a mile across, maybe about a mile across. And there's a couple other smaller ones, the big one, and that's Vesta, which gives you an idea of what that body looks like. Vesta was the first target for Dawn, and then Ceres, this is an actual approach image that was taken, um, uh, I think, in uh, April, I believe. Um, you know, if you've got a, a really uh, pressing question, feel free to ask as well. So I'm going to dive right in and show you Ceres, because I know you really want to see Pluto anyway, right? <laughs> uh, let me ask another question of you. How many of you have actually heard of or remembered that, that Ceres existed at the beginning of the year? There's a few who didn't show their hands. People know Pluto. I mean, it's like in the, in the public consciousness. But Ceres is kind of like this... You know, okay, and it's like, well, maybe I heard of it back in, in grade school or something like that. It, it, it's kind of like this, you know, it do doesn't capture the imagination quite the way Pluto does. But it's still an interesting object. And this is the global map as, as it stands today. And please don't take any pictures because you're not allowed to see this. Um, <laughs> uh, but you can see it's cratered. There's some arcuate streaks here, which are probably ejected from this material. Uh, some smooth areas up in this region, uh, which I think I might have a slide of that later, but, but there's this, this feature here. And that is the bright spot. And if you've been paying attention to like the science page on CNN or, or BBC News or something like that, occasionally you'll see a picture of the bright spot on Ceres. Oh, here's the latest picture of the bright spot on Ceres. Well, that's where it is on the map. It's sort of near the equator. This is your standard map projection, by the way. The south pole is here, and the north pole is up at the top, and the equator runs through the middle, that sort of thing. So it wraps around like that. Uh, again, remember, the whole sphere is about as wide as Texas. So this is what we're mapping. And this is a color map. And I can't tell you what the colors mean, because nobody knows. Um, 
Uh, we haven't quite figured that out. This is a new body. We're still exploring it. So you know, I say that uh, partly in jest, but it's also true. We really don't know what these colors mean. We do know that there's clays on the surface, uh, and that's probably some of what we're seeing. And clay is a hydrated mineral that's been um, altered by, by water. And we know there's water down there, but we actually have not observed ice on the surface. But we see that this is probably a, a re we know this is a recent impact crater. This is a recent impact crater, and there's another one over here. What's happening is that this, uh, a small asteroid, uh, a set of small asteroids uh, has, been, has been hitting the surface of Ceres, and it hits at several kilometers per second. Not per hour, but per second. So it's really traveling very fast. It creates a big explosion, excavates a lot of material. And that's what you're seeing here, is material excavated from below the surface and blast it out so we can see it. And it's up to us to identify what these min minerals are. And hopefully I can uh, uh, ha report on that some, sometime in the future. Uh, but we really don't know exactly what these colors represent yet. But it does show interesting surface, uh, different color patterns. There's this bluish material here, which is actually part of a depression. So we're probably seeing something deeper there. Uh, and then this landed on top of that. And this province is also different. So that Ceres, uh, even though it's small, the size of Texas is clearly divided up into very different regions. Uh, and when we unravel that, when we start getting the elemental abundances where the potassium and the, and the uh, sodium and, and all that was interesting mineral elements are, then we'll begin to un uh, start unraveling this chemical picture. Now, you probably want to see some close-ups of what the surface looks like. And this was actually made here at the Institute uh, this is the, the pyramid, which is an uh, unusual feature which has been shown uh, in public releases from the mission. This feature is about 20 kilometers across, and I'll show a slide in a minute. It's, it would fit inside the loop, the, the inner loop of, of Houston. And it's about four kilometers high. Now, for those of you who don't remember the conversion, uh, divide that roughly by half to get the number of miles. So it's about two miles high. Uh, which is much higher than anything in, in, in the area. So you see it's very sharply, uh, it landed right near this impact crater, but it's very sharply defined, and it's got these streaks on the side. And this shows the latest picture. Uh, we're seeing features that are about 100 meters across or so, uh, the smallest actual individual element. So you can see it's got this crinkly top, and these, these materials are basically it's just a, Think of an ice cream cone that's been cut in half across the, 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 the top, so it's basically a truncated cone. And this is just the map of the inner loop showing the uh, this rough scale of, of the size of this feature. Just imagine this thing two kilometers high striding across the city of Houston, give you a sense of scale. Again, we're still trying to unravel why this thing is here. It's the only one we see on the surface. We don't see anything like it elsewhere. Hmm? Seagulls. Seagulls. Uh, um, I'll, 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 I'll mention that to the, to the project. Isn't it kind of like one of the white dots? No, no, we did not see this on approach. It wasn't bright enough. But what this stuff on the side is, it's probably a material that's uh, sort of crinkling down the surface. It could be a volcanic intrusion that, that sort of forces its way up to, to the surface. Um, there are other hypotheses like. One was that it actually fell from the sky and landed there. There's actually, somebody posted on Facebook a, an image of a, a, a limpet, because it kind of looks like a limpet attached to the surface. Uh, for those of you who have, have uh, sailboats, you know what a limpet is. Does it have anything to do with the crater? No, probably not. Um, th there may be some uh, fractures that extend up to the north. We're not quite sure yet. It's an old surface, so we have to sort of figure it out. But it is very interesting. If we can f get the compositional information, we don't have the spectroscopy yet on this feature. So there are, this is another view showing some of the larger impact craters. This, this basin here is about 270 kilometers across. There's another one up here, which is about half that size. And you see some of this material that's been blasted out. Kind of just went uh, some material out there. And here are these troughs that extend arcing off to the side. Uh, a couple, another one here. Uh, but you see also there's some smooth material here, which is probably impact melt. When this thing hits at five kilometers per second, um, I think I may have said 20 kilometers per second earlier, but it's about five kilometers per second. 
it melts a lot of the material that it hits. It's, it's extremely high. It's faster than a bullet. So it'll melt a lot of the rock. And that's probably what you're seeing here is a lot of the melted rock that's sort of ponded at the bottom of this depression. This is about five kilometers deep, one or two, uh, two or three kilometers, uh, two or three miles deep, I mean. And there's some fractures here. It's a very complicated surface, but you see it is pretty heavily cratered. Uh, so it's been around a while. Not much has happened to it. Um, but there's still some interesting things we can learn on it. And then, of course, here's the bright spots. And this is uh, an image that was taken back in June. You can see it's right at the center of a crater. Uh, you can think of, if, if any of you have telescopes, it's, it's kind of like uh, Copernicus or Tycho in size. Um, this is about 90 kilometers across, and I'll show you some scale uh, information later on. But it's a, it's a deep hole in the ground, basically like a pie tin, like that, with, with uh, side walls. Um, I think it's about four kilometers deep, so it's about two miles, two miles in depth, fairly significant. And then a slightly different uh, exposure uh, to highlight some of the material in the very center. Uh, this is actually a pit. There's a, there's a little bitty hole in the center. Uh, and these we haven't actually resolved yet. They're kind of diffuse and small. We don't know what they're, what they're made of. And there's a movie. Oh, that just shows the scale. This is, the, this is like I-45 from downtown Houston to downtown Galveston, just to give you a sense of the size of this thing. That's fairly significant. And the movie, also done here at the Institute. If I can figure out how to move the cursor. There it is. And we'll just spin it around. Uh, talk a little, a little bit about it. There's, um, uh, we're still trying to verify whether there is water ice associated with this bright material. The spectrum seems to be indicating that it's composed of salt, some sort of salt. Um, there are different types of salt, so we have to resolve that yet. And salts can get there from a variety of ways. You can have a pond of, of, of water that evaporated. Uh, there's a lot of heat that comes in when you have an impact at that velocity, and it can create a lot, and that heat takes a long time to cool off. So you could actually have uh, water steaming basically out of the floor of the crater. And we have evidence of that happening on Earth, uh, terrestrial craters, of course, uh, not in our lifetimes, but uh, uh, in ancient craters, we can actually see the, the evidence of the deposition of, of steam and stuff like that. Um, but that, that's one possible explanation. Um, but we're only at, uh, we're not at the final orbit yet. so. Um, that will happen in November. I'll talk a little bit about that before we transition to Pluto. Uh, so wrapping up on Ceres, we have a lot of questions that remain. Uh, we still have to resolve what the interior structure and with the close-in orbits, we're actually going to get that pretty well. We'll know what the, uh, whether there's a core and whether there's a nice mantle and how thick it is. We'll get a pretty good handle on that. Uh, those data are still being worked. Uh, we're still trying to determine why those bright spots are there and what they're made of. We have some indications, but it's still unclear. Uh, and also whether they're active. And there's even a suggestion that the series may have come from outside the asteroid belt, although I think that's probably not likely. Um, the evidence seems to indicate that, it, that that's not the case. It's actually dynamically difficult for, it, uh, for an object from the Kuiper belt to make its way into the asteroid belt. But in any case, Exactly. The has a sharp edge, which you think if it was impacted, yeah. it would splash right. material, or vice versa, if it was tectonic or whatever, it didn't affect the crater. It that's right. Like they're totally independent. Yeah, that's right. That's why, like, Seriously. some sort of volcanic extrusion or, in, or, or, or plug uh, is one possible explanation that would solve that problem, actually. Uh, so before we move on to, the, to what you really came for, which is Pluto, just a, a brief uh, overview of what Dawn is doing and what it's going to do. Uh, it did its first survey uh, or, or long distance observation orbit, its, well, its first orbit actually, it was uh, back in April uh, at about 14,000 kilometers. And then in uh, June, uh, it, it did this light blue orbit here. For those of you in the other room who, can, who, who can't see what I'm pointing at. And then it's currently in the purple orbit which is, uh, it arrived uh, there about two weeks ago. It's been taking lots of images and spectral uh, surveys. 
and that will last for another two months. And then it will move down in November to what we call LAMO. HAMO is high altitude mapping orbit, LAMO is low altitude mapping <coughs> orbit, so you know, for, for reference. Uh, and you see it's actually quite close to the surface, this is to scale. And that's where you get start getting the gamma ray observations that determine the uh, elemental abundances. Uh, we also get the even higher resolution gravity from that uh, pass as well. But it doesn't just jump from one orbit to the next in a, in a period of a, a couple hours. It actually has to slowly spiral in. And that's what the upper right, I'm sorry, the upper left diagram shows is the actual orbit as it slowly spirals in. Remember the ion thrust is what it uses and it's a very low uh, impulse. So it takes a long time, uh, it takes a, a couple weeks for it to actually migrate down to these lower orbits. So that's what the, orbits, the orbital trace actually looks like. These are the resting orbits where it actually does the mapping uh, observations. So it's here in the, in the uh, purple orbit, or the magenta orbit, and its last orbit, which will be its final orbit, uh, and it'll stay in there for 50 to 100 years, is, uh, is the uh, low altitude mapping orbit at 850 kilometers. And that'll get us down to about 35 meter resolution on uh, the surface, which will be better than anything we have in the outer solar system, actually, uh, from, from Jupiter or Saturn. So it'll be really good. Um, so that's what you really came for, right? <laughs> That's right, that's right. It's reflecting sunlight. Uh, there's nothing glowing on the surface. So, Pluto, discovered in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh, whose ashes, some of whose ashes are actually on the spacecraft right now. And uh, in painstaking, there's a uh, photographic search that was done in the late 20s, early 30s. And these are the uh, copies of the discovery plate, and you can see uh, how he discovered it, the shift in position of Pluto from one, uh, one week to the next was significant enough, and you can actually get a preliminary orbit from that. And of course, further observations confirmed it. And it was the first object discovered beyond the orbit of Neptune. Uh, and they thought maybe it was planet X, but it was obviously, which would be planet 10 in the, in, in the, in the day. Um, uh, but they uh, soon discovered that it was actually rather small. In fact, uh, and I forgot to put it in this presentation, there was a chart that was published in 1980 that showed, in, in a prestigious journal actually, uh, that showed the estimated mass of Pluto over time because it kept getting better and better uh, d uh, definition on how massive and how large the, the, the body was. And it led to the prediction that Pluto would actually disappear around, <laughs> around 2010. Because the curve, you know, fit the curve and it goes to zero at, at a certain point. And I, I, really, I really have to put that in this. It's, it's a classic shot. But um, um, that proved to be incorrect. I'm, you know, New Horizons was launched to actually confirm that Pluto was still there, and it, it is. Um, and, but of course, you know, as you saw in the previews, you know, uh, this, these are actual advertisements from the 1930s. You know, Pluto is very popular in the time. And you, know, you can certainly make use of it if you want. I don't think it's still in production. It lasted, it lasted for a while, yeah. yeah. But Pluto is weird. And, and, and to understand what we're seeing, you really need to understand what kind of weird environment this, this body is in. It's out of the fringes of the solar system as we think of it, which is just beyond the orbit of Neptune, about 35 times as far from the sun as we are. Um, in fact, uh, if you go out in, um, in that sort of odd time of day, just after the sun set, before it gets dark, um, I think it's like 20 minutes or so after sunset, something like that, 30 minutes after sunset. That's what noon on Pluto looks like. Um, but it's barely cold, minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 30 degrees absolute Kelvin, 35 degrees absolute Kelvin. Frozen uh, the surface is, is covered in frozen ices. Now methane, of course, is natural gas, so you use it to cook with. Uh, nitrogen is what you breathe, and carbon monoxide is what you don't want to breathe. Um, but they're all gases here on Earth, but um, those frozen conditions, they condense out as frost and ice on the surface. A large moon was discovered in 1978, and four more moons were discovered in the past 10 years, but they're much smaller. Um, 
Pluto has friends now for uh, about 60 years. Um, we thought Pluto was alone. But then in 1992, the first of several thousand Kuiper Belt objects were found. And these actually plot the orbits, uh, I mean, the positions, rather, of the known Kuiper Belt objects that we see. And you can see it sort of falls off at this point. And that's simply because our resolving power telescopically can't pick up the small objects. Because most of these are smaller than the Earth's moon. So in fact, all of them are smaller than the Earth's moon. Um, um, but um, you know, so, so you actually lose it out here. Yeah, we, we just don't have the data. You see this gap here right at the bottom. This is actually uh, rather important because it's actually in the direction of Sagittarius, the heart of the galaxy, where there's such a dense concentration uh, of stars that it's very difficult to pick out in any kind of asteroidal object. And you're just basically wall-to-wall -wall stars. And it comes into the story at the very end. Uh, remind me to mention that. So Pluto's also slightly gassy. Um, the, the Pluto water you saw on, on the screen earlier is a little fizzy. Um, there's a thin nitrogen methane atmosphere. And this is not Pluto. This is Triton, uh, this image. This is uh, the largest moon of, of Neptune. It's about the same size as Pluto, same surface composition. Um, a little bit smaller than our Earth's moon, just a little bit smaller. But you can see actually up here um, at about, um, that'd be about 1 o'clock position, uh, this thin band of seemingly floating above the surface. That's actually a haze layer that Voyager 2 saw in 1989. Uh, I don't think we've seen anything like that yet on Pluto, but it does indicate that there's an atmosphere on Triton, which we knew. Uh, but it's very thin. Uh, it's about the th uh, same atmospheric pressure as you find on Mars, which is about a couple millibars, uh, which is worse than Everest, I think. Um, so you would not, you would need you know, suits, obviously. Um, this is uh, finally uh, just a sense of scale. There's the moon up at the top and Pluto. This is actually a version of the Hubble uh, images. You can see it's much worse than Ceres because it was further away. But it just gives you a sense that, that Pluto is much bigger than Ceres but smaller than the moon. This is the moon of Saturn uh, called Dione. And then Salvis is the one on the left. That's the one that has the geysers coming out the South Pole um, that are, that's actually active. Pluto's moon, Charon, actually, is about the same size. It's about halfway. Um, it's actually closer to Ceres, I think, in diameter. Uh, it's somewhere between the size of these two. So uh, and I don't have a picture of it here, but uh, we'll see that in just a second. So that just gives you a sense of the scale of the thing. Um, so New Horizons was selected in 2001. It was launched in 2006 on the fastest launch ever, reached the orbit of the moon in nine hours. It's the only launch I've ever witnessed personally, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, and just a brief overview of the instrumentation on board, the radio antenna, of course. This dark, nasty-looking thing is the radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which supplies the power. No solar panels out at 40 AU, just not enough power. Ultraviolet imaging spectrometer, ALICE. I, I did not name these instruments, so, you know. I can't explain what that means, but um, the ultraviolet imager actually looks mostly at the atmospheres because we know Pluto has an atmosphere. We wanted to know what its composition was. Um, it looks at other things too. Uh, Ralph, Ralph and Alice, I mean, you remember the honeymooners. Um, so the visible pan and color imager which, uh, and spectrometer, which gives you the mineralogy, basically where the ice phases are, where the methane ice is, where the nitrogen ice is, that sort of thing. Star Tracker, which we don't care about. Long Range Imager, which is what I care about. Actually, I do care about this one, too. Um, but this is the, the, the High Resolution Telescope, which is the images you'll see in a minute. But it's um, panchromatic. And these are particle instruments, which measure the solar wind and that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a student dust counter, which counts the dust, logically. Um, that was built by students at the University of Colorado, I believe. And then, of course, the radio antenna. This thing is about the size of a grand piano. So it's like that big with the, this thing sticking out the side of it. So to give you a sense of scale. Um, and it weighs, you know, the size of a, it weighs as much as a you know, Mack truck or something like that too. Actually more than that. Um, so this is the trajectory again, really fast going out there, but it still took nine years to get there. And the reason it, it took as short a time as it is, because we passed Jupiter in 2007, and this is just one of the images, sets of images we took. But then, a long, lonely eight-year cruise, we passed the orbits 
of Saturn and the other bodies, but they were all in different positions, so we never got anywhere near them because uh, we were just going straight out. Long, lonely cruise. And this is what we did in July. So let me just briefly go over this so you can understand this time frame here. Each tick mark is, so that's about an hour. So this is about half a day, I think, uh, going across it. You can see the orbits of uh, three of the moons, Charon, Nix, and uh, Hydra. There's two more in here scattered around. I'm not sure why they're not on the slide, actually. But uh, it's basically, uh, think of an arrow uh, hitting a bullseye. Basically, the thing was on its side. The system's tilted on its side. So it basically shot through right at the orbit of Charon. Charon was on the other side. And then on the outbound, it passes through the shadows of both Pluto and Charon in order to do occultations. And that's the best way to get at the atmospheric density and the atmospheric profile. But during this entire time, the spacecraft, the spacecraft was radio silent because it was too busy turning and twisting, taking observations and pictures and doing all sorts of things. So we didn't hear anything from the spacecraft for about almost a day. Um, which was you know, a little bit tense, and I'll show you some pictures of that later on. Some selfies, I had to take some selfies. Um, this is just me wandering the halls and, and doing all sorts of weird stuff. And this is one, one of our, um, what do you call those, pits, I guess, the, where, where one of the teams, this was the geology team, where we all sort of debating various different things and talking about what was coming up and doing whatever it was. So we were basically ensconced there for the entire month of July. And that was our chief there, Jeff Moore, a friend of mine, who's lecturing us about something or other, like he usually does. And we had visits from Styx, the band, not, not, the, not the whatever. This, and he's remarkably well preserved, actually, for his age. But um, <laughs> um, not, not so much for Brian May. But, um, but uh, Brian May, sorry. Brian's a really nice guy. Um, he's a member of the band Queen. Um, I don't know, the Freddie Mercury band, that, that's Queen, right? Um, anyway, but he's a, it turns out he's really keen on stereo images. He has his own uh, company that makes stereo 3D images where you can actually see, you know, like, like the Victorian times where they actually have, you know, um, you know girls or mountains or whatever it was, and, and, and 3D images and, and, and all that sort of stuff. And so we had lots of conversations about that because that's one of my jobs on the New Horizons mission is to make stereo images. The only problem is we haven't downloaded them yet. <laughs> so, um, uh, which I'll get into in just a minute. So we had a few people drop by of, of prominence because uh, it was a big media circus. So this is a couple of that. This is some. Uh, you know, this is a, my thesis advisor being interviewed in the media. And this was a media room. Uh, this was the countdown to closest approach. Uh, where everybody, you know, Chie! but nothing happened because we were radio silent, so there's nothing, <laughs> nothing to do except say, okay, the clock ticked, so the right, right point. It's like, okay, fine, whatever. This was the key moment right here. Uh, um, let me see. Uh, the encounter, the, 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 technically, the, the point of closest approach was at about uh, 11.30 a.m. that day, but we didn't hear back from the spacecraft until about 9 p.m. It was called the phone home moment because it was busy, you know, doing all this, you know, click, 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 like, like, like some guy. Or actually, New Horizons never took any selfies, but um, so everybody was very nervous. It's like, did the thing work? Did it do what it was supposed to? Were there any hiccups? Were there any problems? You know, because you know, occasionally, you know, spacecraft have problems and they stop doing what they were told to do, and and so we were very nervous about that. So. And you can actually go to YouTube, I think, and, and watch the, the playback of that. And you know, the, the chief operating uh, um, officer at the Mission Control Center, Alice, Alice Bowman, was reciting, was waiting for the signal. Oh, we got the signal. And well, I mean, she didn't say it that way. But um, we have the signal, which is the carrier signal. And then we have data. Oh, that was the, the next best step, because the DSN network in Madrid, I think it was. Uh, had to lock onto the signal first and then wait for data to actually come down um, and then read the data to determine what happened on board. So there was this cadence of things that were, was called out. And it's like, uh, okay, the, the spacecraft did what it was programmed to do. That was the, the second big moment. 
uh, third big moment, and then the last big moment was that the tape recorders, or the solid state recorders in this case, were full of data. So it said, yes, it did everything it was programmed to do, and, and secondly, it recorded everything it was supposed to record. Because if, if it doesn't record it, then you don't have anything. You still have to get all that stuff done on the ground. So that was the big moment. Ah, tears and you know, cheers and all that sort of stuff. Because, you know, you know, all these people have been working for 15 years on this project. And of course, the flight of nine years was long and dreary. So there it is. And I had a hand in making this, because that's what I do is map. This is uh, the best global color we have to date. Uh, we're actually going to get a little bit better. Uh, it says a resolution about two kilometers. This large uh, white circular feature here uh, is about the size of the state of Texas without the panhandles on the side. So think of the big rectangular section of, of Texas. That's about the size of it. Um, but this is uh, where most of the methane and nitrogen ice reside. It's mostly here. There's actually some up there as well. But this is the highest concentration. You can see some impact craters here and here and here and here. Some eroded craters up to the north, which is at the top. And then some other squirrely stuff here, which nobody really understands. So we're going to take three close-ups in these three areas, uh, just to show you, because we've only got some of the data down. And then I'll talk a little bit about what's coming up in the next couple months. So um, it's a little bit washed out because it's pretty bright. It's icy. Uh, this was the first image that, that came down at high resolution after the image you saw just a moment ago. And it's like, you know, jaws dropped. It's like, because nobody expected this kind of surface. We were expecting some sort of old cratered train or something like that. But, I mean, this looks like you know some, like like somebody took a close up of, of a leaf or something like that. You know. But the scale of this is, uh, I'd say, about the size of the state of Louisiana. Uh, actually, a little bit smaller, about half the size of Louisiana. Actually. Um, so I mean, these areas are 20 to 30 kilometers across. There's ridges between them. It, it looks as if the ice, this is again methane and nitrogen ice, not water ice, it's just a different kind of ice, but is actually convecting. It looks like the top of like a, uh, if you've had miso soup at a Japanese restaurant, it kind of looks like that, or like the surface of a porridge that's been boiling too long. It creates these little overturned cells like that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, and, and even though it's ice, uh, at those temperatures, that ice, that kind of ice can actually do that. It's actually soft. Uh, water ice would be rock hard, and you need a hammer when, wouldn't break it. Um, all right, well, probably would. Uh, this is the mountains to the south, and if you've been following the mission on the internet, you know that these are images that have been posted already. These mountains are two to three kilometers high, um, and, and then you see the rest. This is an area to the south, so this material appears to actually maybe have flowed out this way, filling these valleys. This is, again, that soft nitrogen and methane ice. Very different kind of place. Um, and again, this is pretty large. This one is, is kind of like that central part of Texas again. Pretty large area. So these are, these are pretty large mountains here. Actually, it's about a little bit smaller than that, but um, still on that same sort of scale. You don't see any impact craters in here. This is an unusually young surface. You saw the areas surrounding it. Those have lots of impact craters, so that's, those are older surfaces. But this is very new looking. It's like something's going on inside that keeps it churning, if you will. Um, and then this area to the north edge of that large circular area, this is the north edge. Um, and this is actually called Cousteau Rupees, a name I came up with, uh, a provisional temporary name um, uh, that we use on, on the team. But you can actually see the material, the ice is actually flowing into the valleys. Uh, sort of like like glaciers here on the Earth do, like, like, like Greenland almost. Um, but these are two to three kilometers high, uh, and they're eroded. Um, and then you see these cells. It actually looks like a brain almost, but the, the brain of Pluto. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I should write science fiction novels. Yeah. OK, so that's what we've seen so far. And it's a very unusual alien-looking surface. Um, got some ideas that this is convecting ice. Why it's in this particular location is something that we've debated quite a bit, but we don't have the answer for yet. Have some ideas, but um, 
could be a large impact basin, for example. Um, so, so the mountains are probably water ice? Yes, because they're high standing, and ice at these temperatures, minus 230 Kelvin, is going to be very stiff and hard and won't flow. So uh, it won't be like terrestrial glaciers, which go down downhill and, and create a flat area. And Pluto, it's more like rock silicates, like Mount Everest or, or, or Mount Kea or something like that, very um, able to support its own weight. Um, the way the encounter proceeded was, of course, we had the encounter day, and then the next day we started downloading a handful of images, two or three a day, uh, because the spacecraft was still doing observing, so it couldn't take a lot of time out. And about the fourth day, this is about the 15th, this image came down. It's like, it's just beautiful. It's just like, this is a backlit thing. We're looking back uh, towards the sun. The sun's actually up to the, off the screen, uh, up in the second floor here. But we're sort of looking back at it, uh, almost not quite an eclipse, but, but, but you know, getting close to that. The ring is actually the diffraction of uh, light due to the atmosphere. And this haze extends 150 kilometers. We weren't expecting that. That came as a big surprise to us. We weren't expecting this kind of dramatic view to show up. But it's just darn pretty, that's all. So. I'm sure we'll learn lots of interesting, interesting science from it, but it's, it's, sometimes it's just nice to marvel at the, at the universe. You see this at uh, Venus. You see it at, at Titan, which is a moon of Saturn that has an atmosphere. And you would see it from Earth if you were sitting on the moon watching uh, you know, the, 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 Earth, um, the sun go behind the Earth, for example. Uh, astronauts actually saw that once on Apollo 12. Uh, so. This is the best global maps we have at the current point uh, for both Pluto and its moon, Charon, and I'll show you an image of this in just a second. But it shows you that we're actually missing the South Polar region because it was in darkness. Again, remember that's that tilted orbit, so that means the South Pole is facing... <coughs> doing that again. Okay, the South Pole, is my, my, South Pole is mostly facing away from the sun at, at this particular epoch in Pluto's orbit. So. We're actually never going to see that uh, area. Um, it's just the geometry of, of, of the orbit and the encounter, and the fact that we couldn't get there earlier. Um, so the equator is here. You see this dark band running across here. Uh, I don't remember what that's composed of, but again, there's that dark circular spot there. Um, and then, of course, Karen. Let me just talk to you briefly about that. Karen is the large moon, and this is a, the view we have of it. Uh, you can see that there's this dark spot at the North Pole, which is up there. And then these fractures run kind of along the equator and then this smooth area. And then right about here, uh, I'm sorry, actually right about there, is this image here. And you notice there's something peculiar about this image. It's very JPEG compression artifacted. Um, you see all these little square blocks equally sized. And almost all the data that was downloaded in the three days or the week, rather, after the encounter, we came back in this fashion. It was just the need was to get as many frames as they could down, as fast as they could, so that we can evaluate what the surface looked like and also evaluate the, the nature of the encounter. Was the targeting correct? That sort of thing. Uh, so we needed a quick look. And that's what we have on the ground right now, is what, what you've seen. You've basically seen everything that's on the ground uh, to date. This is the point in the timeline for the mission where we stand right now, the blue line sticking up and down. We are about to begin in three days, uh, Saturday I believe it is, uh, the main playback, which will take almost all the way into the end of 2016. Now remember, we're 40 times the distance from the sun, and this t the uh, antenna is rather small. There's a trade-off between putting a large antenna on or having more instruments on. So you know, keeping the cost down, we had the project voted to have more instruments rather than a larger antenna, which makes sense. But it means the playback takes a long time. Uh, so we're going to return those compressed data back uncompressed, and we're going to return the rest of the 90% of the data that we haven't even looked at yet. So there's a lot of images that haven't come down yet, including uh, some of these observations. These are just uh, plots showing where the observations are. The images that you just saw on Pluto were 
were these three images here. Those have been returned. We're going to return the rest of this mosaic starting next week. And then this high resolution strip, which will uh, basically quadruple our resolution on the surface. There's three of these strips, one here, one there, and one there, uh, that go across. Basically, as the spacecraft went by, it just dragged the camera across the field of view. Um, and those, we haven't looked at any of those. None of those have been returned yet. So um, in the next couple of weeks, starting sometime early next week, I think, um, we, you can expect to see on the website and on news agencies that pick it up, new sets of images that have been returned from the spacecraft um, and hopefully covering new areas or at least uh, better versions of what we have already. Um, now, not all of the data are going to be returned even in September. It's going to take well into the end of the year before we get most of the high resolution data back. So it's going to be a slow trickle of new images that come down over the next month. But I'm expecting that sometime middle of next week we should have the first of those um, probably, I guess, um, released to the public. I, I, I don't know the exact date, so I can't tell you when exactly. But um, that should be sometime next week, because I know we're planning the first downloads over the weekend. New Horizons is hopefully not done. We just passed this point here. The mission was conceived to actually explore the Kuiper Belt, and Pluto just happens to be the largest member of that Kuiper Belt, which is this zone of, of theoretical objects that exist out here, and there's some large ones out here, which we won't go to. But um, remember that slide I showed with the gap in the heart of Sagittarius? Well, it took until last year for us to actually find targets in that zone, because we're a, the, the aim point for the spacecraft is, just by the nature of where Pluto was in its orbit, right in the heart of Sagittarius. And finding an object, especially one that's smaller than the moon at that great distance, is, was particularly difficult. And it required the Hubble Space Telescope to actually find two objects, which they called PT-1 and PT-3, in this area right here. And they recently chose one. I, I don't know which one it is, but it's either one or three. It doesn't really matter. They're all small objects. They're like 100 kilometers across or smaller. Um, which is you know, about the size of the state of Connecticut, really small things. Um, but they're very characteristic of what most of these bodies out here are like. Uh, so Pluto's large, it's uh, unusual, uh, had a very complicated history. These are going to be probably more representative of what the vast majority of objects are out here. Um, what we have to do is uh, we have to do the engine burn in October to actually deflect the trajectory to reach it which isn't very much uh, energy required because it's actually pretty close to our current trajectory. Um, and then after that, we're going to write a proposal to NASA to get the money to actually do the encounter. And that's a, that's a good thing. We, we need to make sure that we're, we're doing the right thing and we're doing it the right way. So uh, hopefully they'll approve that. The encounter will be New Year's Eve 2018. So it'll be like New Year's Day 2019. So that's, that's a few years in the future because it, it will take, you know, this is a sizable distance from here to here. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll have an interesting object to look at. Who knows what it's going to look like, but <laughs> that's, that's part of the fun. Hmm? Just flew by it, or did it orbit? Oh, no, it went right through. It is, you remember the slide with the bullseye? Yeah. It just went shot right through. You have three passes of the high resolution. How does it do that? Well, it scans. Oh. It, the, the thing wobbles like this. <laughs> um, it's, it was going at like 14 kilometers per second. The, uh, the, the fuel it would have had to take uh, to, to break into orbit would have doubled the mass of the spacecraft, probably. So basically, we're, we're done. Um, well, we're done, we're done for tonight. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do uh, when the new images come down. And that's, that's uh, selfie. We're doing this was at the end of the encounter. We're all being very happy. And, and joyous and taking a, a, a break to, to take a group photograph, and that's, that's me in the corner, yay. <laughs> so with that, I will close and invite questions, and then we're going to step outside for free food. So um, we can turn up the lights, I guess, yeah. get a little bit of light on the situation, and then start with the questions. There we go, OK. Uh, so we're going to Start off by taking a couple in here, and then we'll switch to see if anybody in the overflow room has one, and then we'll just kind of right. go back and forth. So, uh, right here. 
What kind of overlap are you getting on your stereo images? Um, what do you mean by overlap? Uh, <coughs> two images, how, how much overlap between the two images? Um, in the cases where we're doing it, will be full overlap. Um, if you go back to this, oops, sorry, that slide. <laughs> okay, it's, it's here on my screen. Um, but basically, we saw one hemisphere. Uh, Pluto, to set that answer up, um, Pluto rotates. Uh, Pluto rotates about once per six days. So because of the high speed, uh, we saw basically one hemisphere really well. The other hem, the other side, we saw pretty poorly, um, but but well enough to say something at least. So basically, we took a whole bunch of. Basically, we, we saturate coverage this hemisphere several times. And as the encounter shifts, uh, this stereos with this observation, which is the blue outline. So you can see this. <laughs> All right. I'm not sure why it's doing that. But in any case, uh, this, li this, li this line is the terminator, which is the edge between night and day. And you can see how much it changes between the two observations. This is about an hour apart. So that provides the stereo coverage primarily. And there's a few other uh, uh, observations that overlap as well. So we'll get about half that hemisphere in stereo. Now Pluto has to cooperate by having some relief, because if there's no relief, you're not going to see any parallax displacement. So there's not going to be a shift between the two images. Um, so we really don't know. We haven't, gotten, we haven't gotten the second observation down yet. So we haven't been able to do anything. Are there any predictions as to when uh, Pluto's atmosphere will actually collapse based on? Uh, Next question. Um, <laughs> that, there, was a lot of, there was a lot of debate on the atmospheric side uh, as to whether the atmosphere would collapse. And it didn't, um, at least not fully. There's no evidence of the sur on the surface of a massive white snow blanket or anything like that on the surface, as, as far as we can see. But um, uh, the, reason, the reason he's asking that question, actually, is because, remember, Pluto's got this lopsided orbit. It's been moving away from the sun since about 1985, getting colder and colder and colder as it goes out. So that would cause the atmosphere to theoretically condense and, and, and snow out on the surface. But there's been no concrete evidence to say that it has or hasn't. Um, uh, but it's still got a long way to go until it gets out to, to winter. Do we have any questions in the overflow room? I know we have some in here. Oh, okay. Come back yeah, in here. Yeah, we do. Hang on one second. Oh. I think we should just invite them over here. You look great on TV. <laughs> and uh, did, did we get any pictures of the other moons? Oh, um, yeah, that was a good point. Um, the highest resolution has not been returned yet. Um, uh, because we discovered the moons late, after the trajectory had been selected, we couldn't change it to get close to all of them. We could get close to one where we'd get maybe 100 meters, but that image has not been returned yet. They look like basically, the, the low resolution images look like potatoes. and. You're right. I, I I didn't think to actually put those images, even though they're not very good, up on up on the boards. Um, but you can see them on on the website. Yeah, they look like lumpy potatoes, basically. But but they're basically about 100, 50 to 50 to 100 kilometers across. They might be previews of what we see in the Kuiper Belt object, actually, because they, they might have been captured, or not or not. Are they round? Or? No, they're out of round. They're they're like no no more than like twice as wide as they are. Um, twice as long as they are wide, kind of thing. Not, not much more than that. But they're not spheres. No, they're, they're, they're not round. Any more? Yes, as you continue out on this trajectory, um, how do you not hit into something? <laughs> we hope not. It's <laughs> mean. Um, space is astonishingly empty, it's, it's just incredibly empty. Um, and, and this area of the solar system, much more so than the asteroid belt, which is further in, of course. And we operate there freely. So, I mean, Dawn's been operating there for like five or six years now, and 
you know, they're, it's just so spread out. We know where the million objects that we have cataloged are, so it's basically the small dust and stuff that, that you have to worry about. And, and there's, you know, most of that stuff's been cleared out through gravitational disturbances or things sweeping through or, you know, Jupiter's action, gravitational action. It's been, it's, yeah. Is there any more in the overflow at this time? If I understand what you were saying a few minutes ago, it sounded like the South Pole might be uh, in darkness for decades, or I guess uh, northern lati or southern latitudes. Is that is that right? Yeah, it's getting worse. Um, the time to go would have been 1985, when it was closest to the sun. That way, the 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 the, the North Pole and the South Pole would have been equally illuminated by the sun. Basically, it would have been. If you're the sun, the Pluto have been rotating like this. But, it might be very, very so, but, but now it's actually shifting as it goes around the sun so that the south pole is facing more and more away. So the orbital period is about 230 years or something like that, I think. So um, if I remember correctly. Um, so in another 50 to 75 years, it'll be where the north pole is facing directly to the sun. So we can still see some of the southern hemisphere. but. Almost halfway down. Yeah. Yeah, because there's no sunlight and it hasn't been in, in 15, 20 years now. Since, since the 1990, basically, when it slowly began to rotate out of view. I, I have maybe what is a lower tech question, and some the people seem to be very knowledgeable here, but the orbit of Pluto is pretty wonky. Uh, is that because it is something that is extra solar or did it, wh why is that such a weird uh, orbit and, and is any, did any of the observations here maybe help to explain that? Um, New Horizons probably won't help with that um, particular question. That's more of an orbital dynamics question. Most of the objects in the Kuiper belt have wonky orbits. They're all either tilted or they're out of round so, so that basically it comes closer to the sun at one point than the other. Um, and most of that reason for that is that, well, there's a theory anyway, um, that, that Jupiter and Saturn underwent a ma major shift and basically expanded outward and drove objects out. And when they did that, the small objects, uh, the smaller objects became gravitationally or, or, or uh, orbitally, um, I have to be careful how I say this, but um, somewhat unstable and their orbits got kind of knocked around a bit. So Jupiter and Saturn did a lot of the damage. At least that's the theory. Um, that, that, that sort of disturbed things a lot. Uh, and the orbits got tilted and, 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 and bent out of shape. So I got two questions right there, I think. Okay. Uh, th th this is a follow-up to a question that I asked last April. Now that these, uh -oh. you've been <laughs> talking a lot answer. about the uh, Pluto and its kin, is, now, is there any kind of consensus in how to pronounce C-H-R-A-R-R-O-N? Oh. No. Karen, Sharon. <laughs> I don't know what the official IAU. Uh, just uh, did look that that up in in the dictionary. It gave the de definition for the the Greek mythological character as Charon, but I, it may be an op option. I can add a little bit, if I may, to the the orbital dynamics problem. Right. It turns out that. Not only did Jupiter and Saturn move, but in the process, Uranus and Nep Neptune moved during the early solar right, system. Right. Yeah, it and it turns out that the Pluto's orbit is in a resonance with Neptune's orbit. And when you get caught in the resonance, once it caught it in the resonance, as it moved, it probably kept Pluto in the resonance with it as it moved out. Right. And when you do that, there's a strong tendency to increase both the eccentricity of the orbit and the inclination of the orbit. Yeah, one of the consequences is that your, uh, Pluto, and Neptune, uh, Pluto and Neptune will never cross. They'll never hit each other because uh, it, it falls into a stability zone. We've got one more in the uh, overflow room. Yeah. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Um, I'm with it, man. When you were looking back at um, Pluto, to look at, at the occultation, and you found the 150 kilometer atmosphere. Were any of the portions of the surface beneath the 150 kilometers in the uh, 
hemisphere that was in shadow, or was it all illuminated portion? Does, does Pluto have a uniform 150 kilometer atmosphere, or does it vary depending upon whether it's being heated or not? Could you tell? I don't remember if they had a chance to do that. I, I believe the, the image, which is the... Um, Hello. This one does show an asymmetry. It shows the atmosphere thicker on one side than the other, and I can't remember off the top of my head whether that's near the sun or near a particular position on the surface. Um, in one of the higher, there's a higher resolution image of the same geometry that came down, and you can actually see bumps on the horizon and rays of light coming through it, like sunlight coming through gaps in the mountain range or something like that. And, and, and that image, I believe, is on, on the web as well. Um, but that was only one of four, and they haven't returned the other three yet. So and, and this one is lower resolution. So, But uh, I, I do remember that they did discuss uh, that there is uh, non-uniformity in the atmosphere. I just don't remember right now what, uh, what the nature of that was. Hey, we'll take one more in here. Another low-tech question. You said that it spent nine years of finding its way out there using the ion thrusters and such, and then you were in radio silence for a brief period while it used all its energy to go ahead and take the data. I'm just curious on a ratio. Nine years of ion thrusting with basically the house boarded up and then suddenly you open the windows. What was that time period of actually collecting data relative to nine years of being boarded up? Um, Uh, well, first, first one thing, um, uh, New Horizons did not use ion thrusters. So from launch uh, and escape from Earth, it was on coast. Dawn used the ion thrusters um, to actually move out and gradually push its orbit out because it didn't have enough chemical energy to do it. Um, now, we passed, Ju uh, we passed Jupiter in 2007, so we took a, a month or two of observations there. But you're right, we were just mainly doing coasting at that time. Um, in 2013, we did a full dress rehearsal of the encounter, which is basically the nine-day period uh, when we were near closest approach, where they actually went through and took all the observations in 2013, but there's nothing there. So all they saw was stars. But it verified that all the sequences were going to work right. You know, the picture was taken here. They have to rotate to take another picture. So, so they wanted to make sure that all the, because they only got one chance. We actually started observing in January. So the question, the answer to your question is a little bit more complicated. So it depends on how you define data. <laughs> um, so we actually started long range observations in January to monitor the system to search for new moons as we were closing in. And we actually did not discover any new moons. It was just the five that, that we knew before we got there. Because um, they did the searches. Um, but they also wanted to monitor the, the light curves to see what the rotation properties were like. Um, uh, but basically, that time period from six days out is what I would call the encounter frame. So that was the, your last look at every piece of real estate on Pluto. Because remember, that six-day rotation. So by the time you start at six days out and come around, that side is no longer <coughs> going to be visible to you. You're not, not going to see that side again. Um, you're only going to see the other side. So, um, and then, of course, as you zoom out, then it's the reverse of that. Um, so it's basically that six-day period that really is, is key to the geologists and to the composition mappers, because that's when you get your last look, last best look at each piece of real estate on the planet. So I would say that's the time frame you would ratio to the nine years. So um, I can't do the math in my head, sorry. I need a calculator. <laughs> I never could. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Shank. Okay, we're gonna go out, have some food, and yep. then I'll be happy to answer more questions.